you. Thank you so much for those lovely words. As Niti explained, today we will be talking about interactive resources. I know it will be back to back, really taxing. Uh, uh, the cognitive load will be sometimes pretty high, but still I'll try to make it a uh, little uh, more uh, lighter way uh, explaining things because most of the uh, storyboarding and scripting part you really uh, well explained by Dr. Monica. So we'll take it forward from there and ask um, uh, interactive resources. Let me share my screen. Um, I don't know why it's just not showing up. Let me refresh maybe. Okay. Okay. Are you able to? I don't think it is still. It's just showing me a black screen. I don't know. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, this is visible now, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much, Nidhi. So uh, as already Nidhi explained that we will be talking about interactive resources, concept and purpose and the various types and how uh, we can create before that. I'll connect this session with the previous session about basics of script writing and storyboarding pertaining to educational activities, especially uh, interactive resources. And then uh, uh, in the afternoon session, in the practical session, we will be uh, creating a simple interactive activity using H5P um, tool. Um, then uh, I'll also uh, show you a sample of a script and a storyboarding for uh, creating such kind of activities. So before we jump on to storyboarding and script writing for these, I would like to explain about these interactive resources. When we really uh, talk about uh, a dictionary meaning of it, a typical meaning of interactivity is uh, basically it is of a communication, isn't it? How we communicate either in a face-to-face -face or in a blended mode of learning. So it is basically the involvement of users in, in the exchange of information with machines, that is computers. And the very important factor here is the degree to which this happens, at what level this interactivity happens. That depends upon, again, uh, the subject and the topic you chose and your target audience. So we have to understand what level of interactivity is really needed and required. Like uh, she just explained about the ADI model that we follow for whatever the educational content that we develop, right? In the analysis part itself, we should know that at what level of interactivity is required for this particular uh, activity that you're going to develop. So uh, when I talked about these levels, you know, uh, when you go to uh, a e-learning company and you'll ask that I need uh, this uh, package or you wanted to develop some kind of uh, interactive activity, then uh, at what level the interactivity should be? That will be the first question in the market if you go in the market I'm talking about. So what are these levels? Is there any hard and fast rule that these are only uh, uh, described this way? No, not really. But then the e-learning industry, uh, as per our instructional design concepts also, they say that there are basically four levels. Either they start from zero, one, two, three, or they call it a passive, limited, moderate, and fully interactive activity, educational activity, or any kind of uh, information activity, or it could be an infotainment too. So why they defined these levels is because to... Um, I must say that it's basically for uh, to calculate the budgets, like what kind of a software is to be involved and uh, how um, a good it is to our pocket size. All these have to be considered. For example, you take a passive level, you know, it's morally example is this where I'm just talking and you're just listening and not much of an interaction as such isn't it? Either listening to lectures or watching a video or narration or an explainer video or simply reading text. Most of the times we tend to give such kind of a passive learning to our learners, right? In our teaching learning environment. Um, thanks to uh, enhanced or uh, technology enhanced learning these days, we have, we, we moved on to a limited interactivity level that is zero after one, level one, where uh, we are pro providing some tech enhanced uh, activities where uh, a learner will be interacting with the content. 
like simple clicks. This interactivity, when we talk about, like uh, they, they will be doing things and learning. Sometimes they even think before they do anything with the content, they interact with the content. That level is a moderate level. That is a third level. Little more complex interactions. Sometimes we may offer them a scenario-based one, right? And then uh, they have to apply. Again, here, um, your Bloom's taxonomy comes into the picture. Don't get overwhelmed because all these are related, right? When, whenever you talk about any educational activity, it, uh, whether uh, that activity is provoking a lower, uh, you're addressing a lower order thinking skill or you're addressing a higher order thinking skill of uh, 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 for, that, for those participants or the learners that really matters. So when it comes to higher order thinking skills, we definitely move on to a little more complex interactivity that is a moderate form of it. And fully interactive these days, we see that a lot of uh, these forms that immersive learning, that's what we call simulations, role playing and the games, a lot of interactive games. Sometimes some softwares also allow us to, based on the user's input, the content behaves. But who designs all this? You, all of you, teachers, you are the master of that content, mastermind behind those interactivities, right? How content behaves with the learner, right? So it is, it's really important to understand that various levels of interactivity levels when we talk about interactive learning. Also, it is very important to understand the primary types of interactivity in teaching learning environment. Way back uh, in 89, uh, it was introduced uh, by M.G. Moore that three types of interactions when it was the era of computer-based uh, uh, like a uh, trainings, we call it CBT, we used to call it, right? Those days itself explained that what are the three primary types that we have to address. It could be between learner and learner, that is a peer. It could be a phase, uh, sometimes not just in a technology enhanced learning, also in a face-to-face -face sessions. And uh, between a teacher and a learner or an instructor and a participant, right? It can happen, the interaction in, in various ways and the learner and content. Usually in a typical teaching learning environment, all these primary types, three primary types are involved. Then it is really an effective, considered as an effective teaching learning environment. When you provide, provide an option for your learners to interact with each other and come up with a solution, a group activity, a group assignment that you are providing, they, they discuss among themselves. And uh, another type is between the teacher and a student. When it happens, it could be public that you are addressing the entire class or it could be one-on-one -on -one to discuss what exactly the problem to uh, improve the learning curve or why they are uh, not really performing well or what are the concerns that you can interact with them sometimes, isn't it? And sometimes some learners that uh, fast paced learners, they can even come to you to make you explain the further concepts of the typical topic, right? It could be a public or one-on-one -on -one interaction. And then content and the learner. Right? Whatever the educational content or activity that you will be developing, right? You, as I said, you are the mastermind. So the user interacts with it. And then how the content behaves, that really matters. That who decides that how it behaves is the author, that is you as a teacher. When you use a tool, a kind of a tool to really make it more interactive, the content that you create to address or to disseminate some knowledge, a topic, right? So how it behaves, depending on a user's inputs sometimes. If you take a simple quiz also, like whether it is a, a correct or wrong, for example, you take a true or false Usually we tend to just give a true or false question. Okay, this is true, one mark. This is false. Or if it is false, it is one mark. No, you have to explain them why it is true, why it is false. And the feedback is really important. Here, I want to utter one more thing that whenever we create such kind of a activities, when you give a feedback, it is considered, uh, I'm not saying it, it is proven. The theories also talk about it, that a feedback is really considered effective not just when it is a constructive feedback, but also when a learner acts upon it, 
right? When he understands, okay, which is wrong, which is right, why it is wrong, why it is right, why it is correct. And then in the next iteration or in the next test that a learner will behave accordingly because he already got some knowledge about it and then he should improve, isn't it? Or she should improve, they should improve based on the feedback that you have already given. It's just not about technology enhanced uh, uh, activity that you give the feedback, but also in a face-to-face -face session. Okay, talking about these various uh, primary types of uh, interactivities or various levels of interactive levels, basically, uh, we can connect even various pedagogical theories here with interactive resources. Because when you construct, when you author an interactive uh, resource, there are definitely support uh, various theories. Among them, I feel constructivism and behaviorism are most important ones. We all know that uh, learners uh, build their understanding through the engagement, effective engagement with the piece of uh, content that we offer to them. So when we create uh, any interactive learning resource, the learner, the participant will explore that and construct some knowledge. If it is a scenario, branching scenario that you are providing, you are providing application-based questions. They can come up with some knowledge, isn't it, at the end of that activity. And then how a learner, a learner behaves with the content and how this content behaves, right? That's also, there is also, we can say that, um, conditioning, which are the uh, like uh, reinforcement. Sometimes uh, when you create any interactive video, uh, if your the learner marks the answer very correct, then he can move forward. If he answers wrong, then he has to go back all the way to the beginning of the video. That is the punishment that we were we are, are offering to them. That they have to again rewatch the entire video to answer that particular question, so that they can move ahead, move forward. So what exactly is the purpose of interactive? We all know that the active participation. For example, I could see that in my chat, there are many as uh, 16 of them or some, I don't know whether it is about attendance form or are they asking about a question, right? If I'm able to answer the question because of the time crunch, actually I'm not looking at the chat box. Otherwise I would love to make it more interactive that, uh, talking to you and then engage you more actively so that your participation makes uh, the session more lively, right? So that interaction, that that uh, when you provide such kind of activities, definitely a learning, active learning, and based on this critical thinking, and then they can also personalize the way they learn, right? Um, how we can pictureize this is that an interactive resource bridges uh, what is there in the book that is the theoretical knowledge with the practical application, right? When you take a fully immersive learning that uh, a biology experiment that you are in an immersive world and then you are literally doing a zoology or a botany experiment over there and interacting with that practically, you are uh, applying what you have learned about that particular experiment or how that chemical behaves isn't it? Just a small example I gave from a science perspective. Also from a language perspective, we can think about it. And uh, not only that, when you create any educational resource, technology enhanced le learning environment, when you create, you will be able to address diverse learners. Thanks to our technology these days, even the young can access uh, the technology and uh, Whatever we develop, it is it is available to all. And so that's why we have to make sure that whether you create a video, whether you create a document, the accessibility point you, that you have to consider. For example, you just heard about creating videos. When you create any video as a teacher, it's our duty to address diverse learners. For that, we have to create captions. We have to create transcript. We have to give uh, subtitles. What does it mean? Of course, we do have AI these days. It automatically translates the uh, the language of the video, but also the transcript, right? Whatever we are talking, uh, though machine does something, a human interaction is very much important to make it really accurate because we are talking here is about educational videos. So that people who are using technology to access your content like a screen reader, 
uh, so that they were visually impaired or they may not be able to watch the video, but then they can always use a screen reading software to listen to that transcript of the video. Right. And also it gives an opportunity to collaborate and communicate. And the collaboration here is about two, three teachers together can come up and create an interactive resource. Again, it depends on the kind of tool you use. Right. So and then the various types, it could be interactive textbooks or discussions, quizzes, uh, various, various things that we can talk about. Um, I want to concentrate on only main uh, slides here. I hope I have still uh, five more minutes if I'm not wrong. So I'll try to um, wrap it. Uh, but before that, uh, let me explain the best practices, right? Uh, balancing act is very important uh, when you are creating interactive content or for that matter, any educational content. That is that what the kind of challenge you give and the kind of support you provide. For example, a question that you have given and in an inter video that unless they answer correct, they cannot move forward. But then how do they understand uh, that uh, the challenge is really pretty high? But then in the feedback, you should be able to give them the support. Or when you go back at what point that you really explained about this question, that you have to give it very clearly. So that balancing act should be there uh, while creating any interactive resource. Right. And also you have to continuously evaluate it and how um, the learners or users are behaving with that content, keeping them in mind. Then you can in the next iteration, you can always improve it. Right. So also let me make it very clear that because, you know, a tool, because uh, you have some expertise because you uh, did some trainings and you understood uh, certain tools, just don't. Um, create interactive activities just for the sake of it, right? Let the topic demand and address learners' needs, right? In the analysis phase itself, you have to understand. So we will talk about more how to create, what are the softwares to create in the afternoon session. As I said, I'll be talking about a, um, H5P, right? A tool. So that introduction, I'll give you about what are the various uh, uh, tools available and why H5P, I'll talk in the afternoon. So here I want to concentrate on the development process here. As we all know, planning is everything. We have to plan well, really, uh, to create either an image or a text or audio or a video file, isn't it? And after you analyze it, you have to think about what kind of interactivity that you want to develop. Is it just for a formative or a summative one? And then you have to think about the feedback that you want to provide wherever it is possible. And not only that, when you talk about these uh, options of, of uh, developing process that uh, in the earlier session, uh, she told you about various analysis part that you have to do, not just for the video, for any educational content that you have to really discuss well to move ahead with the, either with a script or a storyboarding. What is the difference between script writing and storyboarding? Storyboarding is like visualizing the pre-visualization, right, of what your learners will be experiencing. That is storyboard. A script is like what exactly you're thinking and how it should happen, the process. Either if it is a video, that what is the narration part and what will be the voiceover and who will be doing it or how the shot should be. If it is a video, if it is a bus length or just a talking head video, all these will come in script writing. And also the role of script writing, especially focusing on interactive resources is that we can focus on what exactly uh, with the clarity that what kind of a learner engagement are we providing here. And then structure is structuring the content. And also like a feedback and branching if a learner has to uh, jump onto so-and-so screen after answering this, so that how it, it will happen, that all should come in the script writing. So always you have to start with a clear objective and make sure that you are mapping with your learning outcomes, right? And the content flow and how the interaction should happen. 
and making it more concise and especially learner focused, right? A script writing, uh, what are all the components in a script writing, right? There will be an introduction and uh, with a clear objectives in your mind and how the interaction will happen. Here, I'm talking about interactive activity development. The storyboarding and script writing can differ depending upon the environment that you are in, depending upon the tool that you use, okay? And also the feedback. It again depends upon the kind of tool you use. Here I'm focusing morely on the tool that we are going to use. And then comes a conclusion. How you wrap up the activity. For example, it is a video, right? Okay, here we take a video. How a conclusion should be, how you wrap up, how you give a summary, that all that should come here. So that is about the script writing in a nutshell. And it's to, when it comes to storyboard again, what we do here is how a screen should look like. For example, you are writing a storyboard for a PPT, right? What elements should be there? How you want to navigate, okay? How the interaction should be. If there is a feedback, uh, correct, or a try again, or you have to go back and come to this. So you will be laid out visually what exactly happens and how learners will see it. That is, uh, that is like, uh, I'll give you an example how a storyboard can be created using a simple document. There are, of course, uh, various uh, softwares available these days, uh, but you know, a simple a document, uh, either a MS Word or a Google Doc or PowerPoint or Google Slides, like you can utilize. Here, if you see that, I'll try to make it a little bigger. So this is a long back storyboard when uh, we used to do, um, we used to use a software called Flash. We used to write like who, who is developing and who is a subject matter expert, who wrote this storyboard and template references. For example, you're creating a video based on your PPT presentation and then your entire school board should look alike. Then what kind of a template you should use? You should have a blueprint for that. Your organization should provide a blueprint, but okay, for science, use these templates and then template number that you should have. Then comes what is the voiceover? What is the learning outcome? And what is what are the instructions for the user to go? And then uh, how a development team, here I'm talking about like development team is that if you have different teams to uh, write and visualize and then develop, but here all of them you are doing. So you have to write in how that should behave. In the afternoon session, we'll talk about um, this uh, H5P and then we try to come up with this kind of uh, activity along with an example of uh, um, storyboard. And uh, I want to give five minutes to you. I'm sorry, it's back to back a lecture. I would like to answer if there are any doubts here. Hmm. Uh, could programmed learning be an example? Oh, I don't know. What is this? Attendance link. Format of storyboard. Yes. Uh, especially, yes. Yes, Rajesh Ji. Why H5P? We'll talk in the afternoon because it is an open source and a free tool. Not only that, uh, it is addressing uh, wonderful activities for K-12. It fits into various technology uh, learning uh, and uh, environments right so we'll talk about it more in the afternoon why h5p and why not uh, class point for example right there are many more uh, various tools yes we will do the but then you have to understand what exactly the difference between a, a storyboard and uh, script writing and then how it differs for a video or it differs for any um, activity. For example, what happens is we when we get introduced to any tool, any ed tech tool, we will be really overwhelmed. And then we start creating, we jump onto it and we start creating it. That's, that should not be the process. That should be the process only to practice. When you really want to develop a educational content, you should have a wonderful um, script and a storyboard, then only you have to jump onto development. Then you will have a clarity, you will have a focus. What exactly? Uh, last slide, please. Okay. Yeah, I. Yeah, question set. Yes. Uh, 
yeah depend depending upon yes examples i will give you let me share my screen maybe once again um i don't know which screen you wanted um which slide you wanted uh examples also i will provide what kind of examples that with hyp that we can create uh Depending upon the time, I chose a very simple one, drag and drop, but I'll also try to explain how to uh, incorporate this into video also. And also I will explain that various tools are used to create uh, interactive activities and why we chose HYP also. I'll, I'll try to talk about it, okay? And I don't know which slide you wanted. There are many. <laughs> um, okay. I'm talking about this self-evaluation rubrics also. Like this rubrics could be for each and every software. Uh, it could be a different one. We have to understand that uh, uh, whatever the content that we create, we have to evaluate it and we should have a rubric for that. For that, first you have to master the tool. And remember, technology cannot really replace a teacher. Right, I'm not saying it. The entire world is talking about it, and but we have to take a help of latest technologies like artificial intelligence, for that matter. Now, and from that to a simple Google form, right? It makes our lives much easier. So we, we I mean, there is a quote, Alvin Toffler's quote: "Unless you learn, unlearn, relearn, you are not considered as a literate in 21st century." So we have to sometimes learn we have to unlearn and then relearn so uh the session is only up to what 10 45 to 11 15 that's yes, why i'm hurried actually otherwise i would have stayed and i would love to show you continue with my other slides uh is cit team is here can anybody yes ma'am we are here okay so and still i have some time uh, not exactly ma'am but okay. uh, you can continue at 3 45 okay we will have another sure. session. that's why i want to stop mm -hmm. here that's why i uh, literally uh, cut it down there so i but uh, dear participants i would like to explain that uh it's not about informative session i want some doubts you know it's like you should really pick your brains that uh, to ask me doubts so that i can explain more Thank you so much. Thank you, CIT. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, giving all the required information so that school, so that part. So that participants can understand the meaning of interactive. They can get to know how interactives can be used and how they can be uh, used by teacher and by students. And uh, when you will learn use of interactives, 